the risk was worth taking because that year they ate. Local officials sent a representative to Beijing to ask for permission to continue. In July 1979, an old man, Guo Chun Yi, came to Beijing. First he went to the People's Daily, but nobody dared see him. Then he went to the China News Agency, but still no one dared see him. I heard about him and invited him to my group. When he spoke, he stressed that he was pleading for the peasants. I was very moved. The household responsibility system caused a great debate inside the party. Some senior leaders thought it would upset the whole communist system. But others firmly supported it. They saw it as the only solution to the poverty in China's countryside. In a monumental decision, Deng's government decided to allow the household responsibility system. Soon after, they disbanded the communes, the main means of communist organization and control in the countryside. In villages around the country, like Shenjali, many were confused by this dramatic change. Was this socialism? Was our country still socialist? Was it capitalism? That's what I wondered. What I was afraid of was, there were not enough laborers in my family. My three children didn't know how to farm. I was the only one who worked. Anyway, it was useless to object. It was the government's policy. It was policy. If folks were against it, it was no use, right? Policy is policy. Under the new system, village after village produced bumper harvests. For centuries, the Chinese people had lived on the edge, facing one famine after another. Now, the average family had enough to eat. At that time, there was a popular saying among the peasants. Mao Zedong gave us liberation, and Deng Xiaoping has given us food. Deng wanted to do more than give people food. He wanted to make China a world economic power to open the entire country to market forces. Working closely with him were innovative leaders Hu Yaobang and Zhao Ziyang. Hu Yaobang was Deng's second in command. He had impeccable revolutionary credentials. He had been on the long march with Mao and Deng. Like Deng, he suffered in the Cultural Revolution Some joked they were close because Hu was the only member of the Central Committee shorter than the four foot ten Deng. He was, as we say, a young old official because he was one of the youngest of the older generation. When he had a discussion, he treated others as equals. You could express different opinions and he wouldn't criticize you. He was a good listener. Unlike Hu Yaobang, Zhao Ziyang was not a Red Army veteran, nor a Beijing insider. He had spent his career in the provinces, and he understood the economic realities of rural life. In 1980, Deng decided to use his experience and called him to Beijing. He tried to make you less nervous. He dressed casually, wearing cotton jackets and cotton shoes. Sometimes when he sat on the sofa, he even took off his shoes and put his feet up, like a northern peasant. He did this to make you feel closer to him, so you would tell him what you really thought. As Zhao and Hu Yaobang worked to reform the economy, 
they faced opposition from conservative members of the party who believed the reforms threatened communism itself. In private inner party meetings, Hu Yaobang and Zhao Ziyang argued their case with remarkable frankness. At the top level, Zhao and Hu Yaobang had to report to Deng. Deng thought, this is simple. If there is a political problem, I'll deal with it. What are you guys afraid of? Just go ahead. They launched a bold new plan of economic development designed to attract foreign technology and foreign money. Deng Xiaoping authorized four special economic zones in the south, carefully placed near the booming economies of Hong Kong and Taiwan. The farming village of Shenzhen was one. The government brought in electricity, built roads, office buildings, and apartment blocks. They approved policies inconceivable under Mao. Foreign companies were welcomed with financial incentives. They were allowed to use capitalist business methods. For Chinese workers, wages in Shenzhen seemed fantastically high. From all over the south, people poured into the zones looking for jobs. Most people had to wait a year or two to get a job, but I got one just a month after I applied. It was hectic to start work right away because I was expecting a baby. But I couldn't miss this opportunity. Many people tried to get to Shenzhen, but not all of them made it here. If you worked full time, you had a stable income and bonuses were good. Living standards went up. For example, we got a television and then we bought a color one to replace the black and white. We followed the fashions and didn't want to fall behind. So the changes were dramatic. Economic growth spread throughout southern China. In the early 1980s, most foreign investors were from nearby Hong Kong and Taiwan, where millions of Chinese had fled communist rule. Hong Kong, the booming center of international business, was also one of the last remnants of British colonial rule. At the end of the 19th century, the British had forced the Chinese to lease them most of Hong Kong's territory for 99 years. In the early 1980s, investors began to worry about what would happen when the lease expired in 1997. 